25 to 10 percent of concussions result in unconsciousness that's a really difficult injury to identify mike vega welcome to going public mate thanks for having me mark so you're the co-founder and managing director of hit iq what is your thesis around your technology our core technology is a sensor-based mouth guard and what we're able to do with that tech is capture and quantify head trauma. How big is an impact, the location of the impact, the direction of that impact, but then also over a longitudinal basis. So, you know, capturing and creating a data bank for athletes across their career. So when you go to raise $10 million, what's that process look like? There's just so, so many moving parts to listing a business. And then when you finally get to the listing day, it's a bit of a, you take a deep breath, you're back on the horse again. Mike Vega, welcome to Going Public, mate. Thanks for having me, Mark. Uh, so you're the co-founder and managing director of HIT IQ. That's uh, H-I-T-I-Q. Um, what, what's your ticker? HIQ. HIQ. Right. Uh, this is on the Australian ASX, or Australian Stock Exchange, ASX. Um, let's get into it a little bit here. Uh, maybe tell me a little bit about you're a tech company, Correct. effectively a tech company. Absolutely. Um, yeah. What, what do you guys do? What's your, where's your technology sit? What platforms and you know how? And what is your thesis around your technology? Yeah, good question. So, our core technology is a sensor-based mouth guard. So, effectively, we instrument mouth guard, um, a general mouth guard, with some high-level technology. Which have one here, correct? And what we're able to do with that tech is capture and quantify head trauma, brain trauma. Um, so we do that in an acute sense. So, you know, um, how, how big is an impact, the location of the impact, the direction of that impact, but then also over a longitudinal basis. So, you know, capturing and creating a data bank for athletes across their career. Right. And your, your background is that you're a sports scientist. Correct. As, um, uh, you have, and I don't know what it takes to become a sports scientist, but I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I guess it's a, uh, a master's degree in something in science, correct. I guess. Yeah, sports science. Master's degree in exercise science. Yeah, yes. exercise science. Yeah. yeah. Um, and your your uh, experience in terms of athletes is where? So, <clears throat> my background probably goes right back to the early two thousands. In I was in the US playing collegiate basketball. Had a lot of exposure during that period to American football. Came home, started working in elite sport, and then sort of transitioned into high performance and worked at the AIS. That's the Australian Institute of Sport. Absolutely, and did a bunch of consultancy work alongside that. Um, and effectively, my role was in injury rehabilitation, uh, strength and conditioning, uh, data management, data science. Um, so, you know, I was pretty well grounded in this space, in, obviously in a different field, but um, that translated pretty well to what we're doing now. So obviously sports injuries and or rehab from sports injury covers a lot of territory, particularly if you're looking at runners or compared to basketball as compared to a, a rugby league player or a rugby union player, you know, like there's a, a broad range of sports injuries. Obviously you've, this business specialised in one area, mm -hmm. um, it's more about head injury or head trauma, um, which we'll come back to, but um, in, that process, consulting, contracting, doing stuff with AIS, having experience in the US, um, what did you learn about head trauma relative to sports people? By the way, head trauma can happen to anybody, not just a sports person, <laughs> but head trauma relative to a sports person. Um, and what's the difference between a head injury and say, you know, a bicep tear? Well, this is why we exist. So the opportunity really presented itself because there's just no data. There's no ground source or uh, truth to what we know about impacts that lead to trauma versus the traditional injuries or, or you know, that have a, a background and a, and a longevity of research and science and, and, and um, empirical evidence. We we are bringing data to fast track the knowledge base and the management protocols of brain injury. And we're doing that through our mouth guard data. Um, so that's, you know, when you look at traditional injuries versus if, if you were to segment out brain injuries, 
the, the, the big limitation at the moment with brain injury in sport is data and the lack there of it. So um, that's purely why we exist and that's the opportunity that we're chasing. The brain's an unusual part of our anatomy. It's, of course, underexplored um, relative to the rest of our body. And we can heart, do heart surgery, we can do all sorts of things, you know, they can pretty much sort everything out, most things. Um, brain injury in itself is not a massive problem if there's a rehab program. Um, diagnosis is not that difficult because, you know, you can diagnose you know, someone falls on the ground because they got hit on the chin. That's pretty obvious he's got concussion or she. Um, what is the issue though is does that express itself down the track in 25 years' time post-retirement into you – know, I don't want to start a scare campaign, but dementia, CTE, um, those types of things, um, any type of brain – disease as opposed to the trauma the mm -hmm. question become and that that's the big game at the moment you know all the particularly all the contact sports are confronting this at the moment and we heard what happened in the US with the NFL getting sued and they cost them a billion dollars or whatever um, Aussie that is uh, I think there are some of the codes here are currently um, either being sued or about to be sued how how important is it for a club? Um, and we're just looking at sports people at the moment, for a club to gather data on their players in terms of just defending, for example, what would be considered the duty of care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, that, is that a thing? We think it is. <clears throat> and it comes down to identifying a cause and effect relationship, right? So there's enough emerging evidence now that head impacts cause or too many head impacts, and I'll come back to too many, cause long-term neurodegenerative issues, right? So <clears throat> now if you reverse engineer that equation and you say, well, if you're trying to establish a cause and effect relationship, you have to measure the cause. Right? You have to be able to quantify. It's like working in a factory. If the noise pollution is too much, you need to be able to. If you can't measure it. If you, you can't, can't measure it, you can't manage it. Right? Yep. This is the, the simple adage or old adage, right? So for us, we say, well, there's a tool now that's been validated, extremely accurate, easy to use, that can help the clinician identify potential issues. So when you look at the data, you know, only five to 10% of concussions result in unconsciousness. So it, visibly, it's really, that's a really difficult injury to identify from the sideline, even the most experienced of doctors. So 90% of the time, these guys are running around who do have a concussion, undetected, undiagnosed, are continuing to run around and compound that injury. So this tool that we have and the technology that we have is a, effectively an intervention tool to be able to help the doctors identify this injury before it gets to the point where these guys are having to retire because they've had you know, multiple or ongoing unmanaged and undiagnosed head injuries. As in mini concussion, so to speak, at training correct. or wherever. Yeah, correct. So, so because you know, there are, obviously there are diagnostic tools that exist today, whether they're complete and accurate or object, uh, uh, objective enough is another issue. I mean, we have things like SCAT 6, we've now got SCAT 6, not SCAT 5, we've now got the VOMS. There are some um, other devices that are being developed by various organisations. You're, you're, you guys, I've noticed you guys are talking, have one on your website um, outside of this mouth guard. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it, it, this is more, more um, this is your mouth guard, we'll have a look at it in a second, um, but as I understand it, your mouth guard's more a, a predictive tool um, in that I guess you use AI, but your mouth guard for any one individual can say people who have experienced this impact measured by your mouth guard, that's in my mouth when I'm playing footy, whatever I'm doing, um, the level of that impact ordinarily would suggest that someone's had 
a, would, would has received a concussion. Mm-hmm. Concussion is a weird word. Um, it covers it covers everything. Mm-hmm. You know, like it covers too many things. Um, and it's not just about acute concussion. This is about lots of little concussions too. Mm-hmm. So instead of just saying you got an acute concussion, you got knocked out, you can't play for eleven days. Maybe you got ten mini concussions over the last five training sessions. You can't play for eleven days. Mm. That, that's probably equally an important outcome for the player if the player's welfare is at the front of our screen. That, that, uh, and, is, that is true. You know, and if we've got a duty of care, mm-hmm. as you said earlier, measurement. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you can't just say, oh, "I saw you might get knocked out because you, you know, when you stood up, you fell over, or your, your legs went on you, or you're suffering from dizziness, or whatever the case may be, yep. or you're vomiting." Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure, that's a pretty obvious one. Mm-hmm. Come off. Eleven days, but your point, I think, I think your point is, if if I suffer in that game, four or five uh, heavy impacts, and it might not even be to the head, mm-hmm. it could be to my body, mm-hmm. and I get whiplash. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the idea. This is this thing he measures that. Is that? Am I correct? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, I would ask you this. I'd imagine this is individualized because. Whilst, you know, like, I don't know, Gordon Tallis playing NRL might be able to take, or Jared Hargraves might be able to take much more um, impact than, say, Luke Keery mm-hmm. or Sammy Walker playing for the East because just by virtue of size, neck size, for example, mm-hmm. could play an important mm-hmm. part of these things, mm-hmm. skull size, thickness, um, body weight, Relative to the body weight, the, relative to the mass or force that's just hit you, mm-hmm. you know, force is a big part of all this, and sure. you know, we know force is the mass by speed. Mm-hmm. So, this I presume this is building data for each individual, and then cross referencing against the whole um, universe of data that you have. Is Correct. that is that what's happening? Yeah, absolutely, and that's been a big challenge in our journeys, you know, to get to the point that we're at to be able to do these wonderful things, we've had to collect a tremendous amount of data, right? And over a wide varieties of populations. So yeah, the, the, there's a lot of different variables we have to control for and all those ones that you mentioned are true, but you know, the brain tissue has, you know, everybody's brain tissue has very similar properties and what we effectively measure is the biomechanics of the head, right? So we can measure the acceleration that is applied to the head, so because that's, that's, the, 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 these have accelerometers in, correct, in them correct, somewhere. Correct. Yeah, that's right. In, in, in the mouth guard itself. In the mouth guard itself. Yeah, and uh, maybe you could just explain what an accelerometer is. Yeah, so it measures effectively the the, the speed of of movement in, in layman's terms, um, uh, but we also measure the the linear and the rotational acceleration. So there's two very um, different type of biomechanics that can be applied to the head. So the rotational acceleration is when you see guys get those sort of light clips to the jaw and you think, geez, that's an innocuous impact, but it's it's knocked them out versus the linear impact, which is, you know, a traditional jab to the head in a boxing environment, for example. Um, they both have very different outcomes. So yeah, neck strength and all those different variables are important. But we measure this basically the, the the biomechanics, the outcomes of the head, what happens to the head, whether it hits the ground, hits the shoulder, head to head impact, whatever might happen. We are measuring the biomechanics of that head and then using that data to infer basically the force that goes through the center of the brain. And therefore and we use algorithms and so forth to do and that. And therefore predict something. And that's where we do not currently predict because we're not a medical device. Okay, well that, that's important. This is not a medical device. It's not a medical device. Right, so you didn't need to get TGA approval or anything like that. Correct. So that's important to note. But what is it then? What do you call it then? If it's well, not, it's, it's just, just not a, a medical it's a, device. It's, a, it's a just yeah, effectively a low-level measurement device. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. So but if, where we are at now with the volume of data that we have, we can start to apply these, method, these AI, ML methodologies to move into that arena. Um, and, you know, we've got, you know, we've done a bunch of work internally with you know, with our R and D team, where you know we've got some promising sort of product roadmaps that will emerge. But the, the focus has been just on collecting the data, 
So. Right. So did you guys, do, do you or your team, develop this actual hit IQ mouth guard? Yeah, like, from yeah, go, yeah, from yeah. go to way we've, we've developed it from right. scratch. Yeah. And and in terms of this particular mouth guard um, or your, your product, because as I understand there's one or two others around mm-hmm. um, um, I've, I've heard of, um, your one in ter- in, prior to getting listed on the ASX, um, did you have to go out and get – or was it a cri- mission critical to get patents, et cetera? There's a tremendous amount of prior art in the literature. Um, we do have a number of patents in application at the moment. Yep. Um, so patents pending. Yep, patents pending. We've got a, um, we've got two Australian innovation patents as well. Um, so they, they cover design, utility, you know, a variety of different um, – uh, areas of of the of the IP, but it you know it it was a consideration, and we are obviously compliant as a business. But um, yeah, it's it's been sort of just build and iterate, build and iterate, and work within the parameters that we have to work within. So like so, when you were listing, whoever was your sponsoring broker in terms of the listing process and the organisation that do the DD on you to talk to their clients, all that sort of Correct. stuff. They didn't. They were happy with that. They didn't sort of say, "Look, patents are a big deal," because for the reasons you just mentioned, they didn't. They did. They didn't sort of say, "We must have patents in every country in the world." No. No. So, what were the before you went to market? What were the non-negotiables that the advisors that, that you guys had um, said? Look, these are the things you have to get get sorted in relation to, for example, to this particular device. Yeah. So. There was probably two things, and I, th- I think you know we ha- we had been in a really prior to the listing a really heavy R and D process. Cost money, cost a lot of money. But one of the challenges that we've had is the sort of wheels of science move quite slow. Mm. So the the actual publication and the and the evidence of utility and the actual tech working and the validation, all of that body of work that we had to do um, in the lead up to that process um, was one of the non-negotiables. So I go just stop there for a sec, Mike. So that, that's an important one. So as I understand, these are the steps. Um, you know, you design it, you build a you build it, your mouth card that is. Um, and then you've got to validate. It's got to be validated. So in other words, you've got to find um guinea pigs to test it out or you've got to find people to test it. You can't t- test it out in a mouse. Mm. It's not a mouse model, it's a human model. Yeah. Um, so you've got to get, find people to validate it. Yeah. So what does that validation process look like? So and and you, I think what you said, you had to do this pre-listing. So how did you go about validation? Who do you find? Yeah, good question. So there's there's the word validation is a loaded term. There's many levels to what we've had to do. So the first one was purely, can you put electronics into a mouth guard yep. without compromising a the mouth guard or b the electronics? And will the player wear it? Yeah, well, comfortably. Is it comfortable? Yeah, and and you know from where we are, where we were to where we are now, from a size and comfort perspective, it's just out of this world how well we've been able to miniaturize um, the size of the the, the device. The electronics, yeah. So. <clears throat> Yeah, so can we, like basic questions, you know, can we even do that? And, you know, we answered those pretty well and then it was like, okay, well. How, how, do you, we, how do you go about it? How do you go about it, finding someone to validate it for you? Like do you go on to a junior league or well, a girls first, yeah, basketball? So the, or something? the first part was more of a manufacturing question and right. that's where, you know, my co-founder, um, Lucas Lang, he, he was a dental prosthetist and right. had the expertise in the prosthetics and manufacturing. So we went through that process and ticked that box and then the next part was the data. Right. Right. How do we actually extract data out of this thing, um, and how good is the data? Because we're talking about sensor systems. That's right. And um, and you therefore have to have software sitting on the other end, assuming the sensors work, which obviously they do. But someone, something, a machine is receiving the the, the data. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I presume it's not going to be the other way. You're not sending anything in there, are you? You're not sending stuff back. So you're just receiving data, and then on the re- reception side, you've got uh, software which interpret or banks the data, correct? And then maybe interprets it, but at least banks the data. Um, so you have to build software around that. Mm-hmm. So ha- who did that? Who, who's your yeah, so CTO we, stuff? Yeah, so we built all that on the back end. The primary concern through that validation process was actually validating the data. Right. And, you know, to give you some background, when we first started, the, the accuracy or the sensitivity of the device was at 40%. Which means, oh, so, so 60% of the time it didn't, it, it was, was wrong. It was, yeah, the data was just so, it was error prone. Yeah. And well, either that or just unusable. <laughs> yeah, and they're at 97. So it's, you know, that's been a journey in terms of validating the actual data coming out of the guard and we've had to do that 
in two ways. We've had to do it in lab. So test crash dummies and, you know, when we're Actually, not real people. Though. Not real people. So yeah. we've, we've built devices in our laboratory that uh, is able to effectively, we can bash around and, and you know, we've instrumented those devices with really high level sensory um, apparatus so that we effectively are comparing the ground truth, which is the sensors inside of the test dummy versus the mouth guard, which is attached to the dummy. Um, but when we started, there was nobody that could actually, that was fit out to basically complete that testing for us. So there's these car cat crash test dummy facilities, but we were too small to engage with them. They didn't have the specific type of dummy that we needed. So we had to build it ourselves, which took longer than we had wanted and hoped. Um, but we went through that process and then the next part was the field validation. So yeah. then we had to instrument actual athletes and record them. How did you find them? Um, it wasn't that hard. So people, were they, people, people, were, people were willing to participate. But how? how? Like, I, I guess we we had people out in the field sort of building relationships with groups um, that were willing to sort of help us out really. So, um, But it was very structured, you know, in terms of what we needed and what we required from, from them. You know, we needed them to obviously onboard their athletes. They had to wear the technology. On the back end, we had to use video verification to, you know, capture all the impacts and then figure out the false positives and the false negatives and then build algorithms to repair. And then Did you do with adults or, or teenagers or girls or boys? Uh, it was done in amateur. It was done in the Essendon Footy League actually right. uh, in Victoria. So it was just amateur uh, yep. male athletes at the, to start with. Yep. Um, and they were our sort of first testing protocol and then we sort of evolved out and we started working with the AFL, the, actual, the NRL some time ago. Um, and the reason why we had to work with those guys is because of the quality of the vision that we required to be able to validate the field data. So, so just so I understand that, um, the field data is coming off the mouth guard. Um, so he's sending some data back to your system, which you know, you're know you reading, but you need a video to say, yeah, well actually he or she just got hit quite hard by someone's shoulder or arm or whatever the case may be with the ball. Yeah, well, that's right. So, you know, Mark's instrumented with our mouth guard. We've got the camera on Mark. The data file is synced up to the video file and, oh, look, there's an impact, but he's just running around. There's no impact. Mm. So, oh, he it was actually, he was yelling. Yeah. So the yelling creates an impact yeah. profile on the data. Right. So we've had to build, you know, over time, these other algorithms that filter out all of the false, noise. Yeah, false positives. Yeah, that's right. You know, and guys will put their mouth guard in their sock and go for a run and the file will show that he's had 200 <laughs> yeah. really high level impacts and we're like, well, he'd be dead. So that, that's not it's not real data. So, so the validation probe is really valuable. It's really valuable. Yeah. Just And it's and it all goes down to trust and build, building a body of evidence around, hey, this actually works and this is the work that we've done to prove it. How long did the validation process take? It it. it Took us over five years. Five years. Wow. Um, can I just open this up? Yeah, maybe absolutely. I, yeah. My thumbs are no good, so maybe I'll get you to open up. Okay, just look. Right. So um, I can see you. So this is a sort of normal, traditional fitted mouth guard. Correct. Um, and inside there, we've got uh, looks like some um, yeah, so circuitry. You, yeah. So and, you've got a, ba and, a battery. You've got processors. You've got accelerometers, gyroscopes. Um, there's an array of tech in there. Yeah, so th this charges in there. Correct. Um, like a mobile phone sort of thing. It's all wireless, yep. yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, this is now sending messages to somewhere else. Um, is it sending it to that and that well, sends it on or where's the well, message? No, no, because it's not in your mouth. No, but what, how does it know it's in my mouth? There's a there's a sensor in there that can tell. It's in my it's, mouth. It's yeah, so mouth once it's in my mouth. In mouth detection system. Yeah. Correct. So that, that's important because that way someone, as you say, put in their sock, it doesn't record anything. Correct. Yeah. So that uh, once it's in my mouth, it detects it's in my mouth. Yes. Um, it's obviously some some trick or secret that you guys own that says it detects. And um, and then it's, then it starts sending messages. Is it constantly sending messages or it only sends a message when there's uh, an impact? Yeah, so only when it surpasses a threshold yep. do we record right. that data. Right, interesting. Um, so, you know, we can set that as low as we like. It's generally set around 5Gs. Yep. So anything above five Gs. Yeah, what's it, what, tell me what five Gs means. Like, uh, I mean, I saw not this, but explain five Gs. Well, five Gs. You know, you see. What's it like? So you'll see pilots do training at let's say nine G, and it looks quite intense. But that's nine G applied over time. So when you look at how long an impact 
exposure lasts for. It's only five milliseconds at times, sometimes 10 milliseconds. So it's a very short, sharp exposure to that force. Um, so 5G is a really low level impact. I mean, we've seen guys expo exposed to 120, 130G impacts, which is, you know, are massive impacts. Um, so yeah, we set, we set that threshold relatively low and sort of disregard all the low level, um, not, not important, <laughs> you know, cause even like changing direction, for example, or a jump and a land can elicit some level of a G, um, G force. So we've set five. I mean, it, the research is emerging on what the number needs to be, but we want to capture as much as we possibly can. Right. Okay. I, so, so you guys doing, how did you, how did you fund your process before you listed? So how, how is that all happening? Cause I mean, it's, it's a, it sounds like five years, a lot of work, a lot of research, um, a lot of design. I guess you've got mechanical engineers and you know electrical engineers building your, or mm. you know co coders at least, or computer scientists building your software, etc. Um, how does how is this all all this funded? What are we talking about, Branham, for example? Early days, yeah, yeah early days. So, <clears throat> look, it, it. I mean, we've spent over sort of twenty five million bucks to date over the life of our journey. Which and is how long? Uh, well, we started seriously in sort of 2017. Right. Um, 2016 was a year of sort of experimenting and, you know, can we do this? But then 17 was when we first took external funding. Um, and really, look, it's just been a, a high net worths that have yep. helped us along. And so how do you find a high net worth? I mean, everyone keeps saying like, oh, well, they're just like they you just go out there and scratch the surface and there's a high net worth sitting underneath the building. <laughs> like where do you find high net worth from? <sighs> this is this is a good good question. So... <clears throat> not coming from the corporate world. You know, that was obviously a big learning curve for myself as a co-founder and, and sort of the lead on the funding mechanism of our business. But it's just, it's door knocking. Yeah, but how? I mean, just, how you, just, is there a high net worth list somewhere? Yeah, like Yeah, you, you just meet people who then refer you to other people and say, hey, this guy might be interested. And then you just follow the, the, you follow the breadcrumbs, so to speak, and you eventually meet, in, you know, a, in enough people um, that, you know, you're able to, it's just like a sales a funnel, right? Like you speak to 100 people and three will invest. So, you know, my black book is full of a lot of people who had, <laughs> who didn't believe in, in Hit IQ and what we were trying to do. But um, but that's effectively what it is. It's, just, it's, it's a sales funnel and you, you're going out and you're trying to talk to as many people as you can and, you know, you're telling the story and you're showing them a roadmap of what you think the next 12 to 18 months looks like. And most of the time you're wrong. Are you talking about VCs? <laughs> Do you talk VCs? We've not been on the VC radar. Yeah. We don't fit that model. Right. Um, what does that mean? Well, hardware technology in Australia is, is is a difficult proposition to fund. And, you know, we've we've sort of taken a path less travel in the sense that, you know, this isn't born out, this tech or IP is not born out of university land. So we funded it from day one, right, uh, privately. So, you know, there was... We just don't fit the VC model. The, you know whether or not the addressable market is big enough for them. Hardware tech is hard to fund, particularly in Australia, and the VC pool in Australia is obviously quite small as well. We did have a plan um, in three two thousand nineteen that we developed that we're going to try and get some US funding, but then we got hit with the pandemic and that sort of threw things up in the air for a period of time, and then that. That event pretty much put us on the A6 a, route, yeah, to a pathway to an IPO, because we couldn't f keep funding it as a private business. We needed the access to the capital and the public markets, right? Um, so, yeah, so that that was pretty much the, the limitation that we had in the Australian market. The, the the VC pool was really limited. We were generally attracted to you know high net worth, small family offices, you know those types. So, so okay, so you've now got. Um, uh, high net wealth investing in it, helping you fund it along the way, but it's sort of pretty stressful, I guess, because um, you're always looking at your runway and you're probably thinking to yourself, my God, we won't last another six months. <laughs> but you go get some more money, um, perhaps go back and talk to the, these high net wealth that are already invested. Perhaps they might have might, might bring some more on. But at some stage uh, around the uh, COVID period, um, you decided to go on the A6. When I look at your uh, website, I notice you've got a lot of heavy hitters on your, it looks like advisors or board members. Um, uh, you've got 
professors, uh, etc. How important is it in terms of listing on the ASX, in other words, an IPO on the Australian Stock Exchange, how important is it for cred to have, you know, neuropsychs and uh, neurologists, etc., on your – I don't know, I can't remember if they're on the advisory board or on your board. Mm-hmm. Um, how important is it to have those individuals there? Super important. I mean, in, in all aspects of life, people look for social proof, mm. you know, and having, you know, high-level academics and researchers and practitioners who are – Supporting your journey and believe in your journey is a really good indicator, a good signal to you know the investment community. How would you get to them? I mean, I, I noticed that uh, one of your one of your your are they board members or advisory? No, members? they're they're on advisory boards. Okay, because yeah. it's difficult to put them on the board because they have liabilities associated with being on the board. Correct, and you got DNO insurance and everything, directors and officers insurance, which you have got to sort of sort out. So you put them on an advisory board. I get it, um, which have to pay them something for. Um, one of the neuropsychs you have on there is out of Newcastle University. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you find the, these individuals? I mean, do you get someone to push in contact with them or how do you select these particular individuals to be on your advisory board? Um, for a variety of reasons and they all bring different skill sets to the table. Um, but when, you know, I suppose when you manoeuvre through the journey and you start to get some momentum in the market and people are talking about you and you're trialling in the AFL, for example, or whatever it may be, you start to become a magnet for, you know, for people of this calibre. So the conversation becomes a lot easier. I mean, when we first started, it was a, it was a pipe dream, right? So you sort of have to tell the story and you've got you to onboard people and get them to believe, right? And that's not only the advisors and, you know, those type, but also your employees. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of the advisors, I mean, I think when you've got leading tech and you're actually solving a real problem. Which they're probably researching. They're researching and you're a real value add to them, they're a value add to you. So it's a really um, synergistic relationship. So well, how, what do you offer them though? Like you, you have to put, um, well, I, don't not, need, I don't know any detail, but it, like, do you have to offer them equity or cash? No, or? not equity. I mean, it's some of it's cash, um, a very nominal amount really. You and know, and it, why do they do it though? Well, because they want to, they want to advance the space. Yeah. And they see us as being a primary source of doing that. So, you know, they want to be involved and they want to be part of the program. So um, that's, you know, there's a lot in it. Do they want access to the data? Um, Yeah, there is some of that. Um, So, you know, we we, we work in a confined space with data, right, Right. because of the sensitivity of not only the issue but also the data privacy laws and I was going to say all the ethics associated with this stuff. Do you have to de-identify everybody? Yeah, correct. Everything is de-identified? Everything is de-identified, but if the athlete wants to see the data, it's It's okay. It's okay. So you're not – If if they release the data, you know, that's also okay. Are you sharing the data as it occurs with the athlete, with their healthcare provider? Uh, at this stage, this year we will be. This year, so historically we haven't. Yeah. Um, and look, there's been in, in in that journey in terms of educating the market, educating the the, the medical people, um, the, the clinicians leads. are really they're it's a off. big deal. They're risk off, right? Yep, and yep. you have to convince them, and then you have to convince them again, and then you got to convince them yeah. again. So you know that process of educating the clinicians and the medical committees and saying, hey, this is what we're doing. This is the data. This is what it means. And it's it's just a process that you have to go through with them. What well, platforms are you using, Mike? Like you're using, um, I don't know, uh, LinkedIn. Um, you know, in, in other, uh, I'm talking about not publish occasions. I'm not talking about medical publications, although I'm sure you guys are doing those things. But what platforms are you using to, let's call it promote the idea, um, Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, et cetera. Yeah, so we've largely been a, a B2B play yep. to date. Um, so, you know, it's building direct relationships with people. So the rehab people at the club, for yeah, example. The, the medical directors and yep. the club doctors. CMOs. CMOs, those types of characters, right? So building direct relationships with them, building trust and just onboarding them on our journey and saying this is what we're doing. Yeah. Right? And just keep to c- continual updates. It's just relationship building, right? It's, but you've been doing it for nine years. Yeah, it's a long it's, road, it's eh? It's a long road, right? So, so when did you list? Uh, 2021. 2021, middle of the pandemic, which is yeah. a bit of a go. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, the, the decision was pretty much, much made 12 months yep, prior. prior. So it takes that long to, to get go sorted. through the process. And how much did you raise? We raised 10. 
10 mil. Yeah. And it, it, it all in or did you take – or did someone take something? I mean, what's that process look like? So when you go to raise $10 million, obviously your sponsoring broker, or if I'm assuming you have one, but your sponsoring broker says – um, do you want to take any on the table uh, or are you going to leave all the dough in there? A lot of times um, new shareholders insist that you leave everything mm-hmm. in there because they don't want you to take anything off the table. So what was your process? How did you guys go about it? Yeah, no, nobody took anything off the table yeah. um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, we're so small and there was so much yet to prove that it would have been a really bad signal if we did. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, it, it, and obviously the, the blue sky and the opportunity – and where we were tracking and where we still are tracking, obviously, is you know could be a really significant business. How do you how do you establish a value? I mean, that, that's a pretty <laughs> yeah. hard thing because I mean, I don't know if you, you're probably not making revenue or much at that stage. Yeah. So it's not a revenue model valuation. So it may be in terms of total addressable market potential revenue, but like, um, hey, how do you work out a value? Because you're giving you're giving away a percentage in return, ten ten million dollars. Yeah, I'm trying to work out. How do you work out what percentage you're prepared to give away? Yeah, because then that's all subject to the value. Yeah, yeah, and that, and and that's the fight that you have with the brokers because yeah. they're. But how did you work out a value? <sighs> oh, well, it's worth. It's, as you say, it's worth a hundred. Yeah. Happy to give ten percent away I for thought, ten. I mean, is that how it worked? Yeah, I thought it was worth a billion, but no, it, it, you know, it, it's 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 a tough conversation because you, you know you look at what you spent and you're pretty much pre-revenue. I mean, we had a bit of revenue at the time, yeah, but the revenue wheels hadn't started turning, yeah. So you know you can't point to sort of multiples of revenue. So it's 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 largely a, well what what's the dynamics of the market? You what don't have a user market either because yeah, you're not out there. That's right. Yeah. So what, what what do we think that? When, first thing is we need to get the ten mil. So yeah, ten is what you need. We need it to right? give you a runway. By the way, how many years is that? Two years. Two, years. two years. two year runway. Yeah. Okay, right. So the first thing is you need the ten. Yeah. And then the next question is well, what's the market going to accept as a valuation? What yeah. story can we sell? You know, based on and then the brokers obviously want it on the low end because yeah. they're selling it. It's easier. So it's easier for them. <laughs> and, you know, there's more upside. You know, the, the founders and, and the, the shareholders, the existing shareholders want the higher number, yeah. right? So yeah. there's a bit of push-pull negotiation. It's just an arm wrestle. It's an arm wrestle. There's no, so there's no science. It's really an art. It's an art, yeah. absolutely. And, I, an art. and you have to learn that art. Yes. I mean, I've been through the process a couple of times. But, I, I yeah, it's, and I, I just want to hear, hear you say that because it is an art and there's no science. Because people look for science. They go, oh, my God, you know, there must be some sort of uh, formula, that uh, magic formula, mm-hmm. that, secret formula that everybody applies. Yeah. It's not. It, it's not scientific. It's You can have some, apply some science perhaps if you've got revenues or if you've got a million users or something, you may be able to apply some sort of um, science that might be able to relate back to what someone else has done. Mm-hmm. But if there's none of those two, it's more art. In other words, we you said we spent 25 mil. Maybe it's worth 25 mil because mm-hmm. if someone else was to get to this point where we're at, it's going to cost 25 mil. That's right. So listed 2021. Um, how's it, what did you think of the experience of the IPO? Mm-hmm. What was that like? And how's it been so far? We're 2024 now. Wow. Yeah. Um, look, there's just so, so many moving parts to listing a business. Um, and when you're a small team like we were, you sort of – you don't outsource too much of it. You do a lot of it yourself, mm. you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a big exercise. And then when you finally get to the listing day, it's a bit of a – you know, you take a deep breath and then – you're back on the horse again because then you've got, you, you run your business and deliver on, <laughs> you know, what you've told people you're going to deliver on. So, um, look, it, I wouldn't say it was a negative or positive. It was just – it was what it was. And, and, you know, there was a small um, – you know, there was a small hit on the share price on the day and then it sort of trailed off. And, you know, we've had probably – if I was to sum it up in the last sort of three years or two and a half years, it's been a, it's been a challenging experience for a small – Cash burning tech business in Australia, or well, globally, really um, hasn't been a friendly time for for our type of businesses. Well, tech businesses have had have, have copped a hard time. Yeah, that's right. Tech businesses generally, have, yeah, and you know you're fighting for news flow, and 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 it, inherently the business that we're in is that to get a, a cornerstone customer, there's a long tail in that process. So you're not churning out really high volumes of, of news flow. So then that, you know, impacts the retail investor who doesn't have the patience to yeah, sit well, in. Also, they get another offer coming up. Correct. And they just flip out and they, yeah. if there's, and a, yeah, they correct. go into the next deal. Yeah, so you're fighting for liquidity in, in, in your stock and you're trying to f- get new people coming in and you're trying to grow your business. So it's been a real challenging time for us. But I think, you know, we've, you know, we've really 
you know, kicked some significant goals over the last two years. We work with the Premier League, you know, the AFL. Um, there's a number of different organisations that are pretty developed in our pipeline that we're, we're confident on landing. So we're, you know, and, you know, World Rugby have just mandated the technology. So we can see... Technology generally or you know, he, your, your stuff. sense of technology, yep. mouth guard based technology. So... And this is, was part of our vision when we started. We could see that there was a pathway to this happening and it's starting to unfold before our eyes. Um, it's probably taken a bit longer than we thought. Always but does. It always does, but it's but it, it is trending. So we're pretty we're pretty excited by what's coming. Well, it's, well, it's interesting, Mike, because right now um, the, this whole territory is trending around concussion and all the other things that are associated with concussion and also measuring concussion and detecting concussion and rehabbing on concussion, et cetera. And I know your website is very cool. Like it's uh, qu- qu- quite uh, detailed and complete. I, I had a quick look through it this morning. It's, it's pretty cool. And this stuff, sometimes you have to wait for people to catch up to their technology. I mean, like iPhone, uh, telephones, mobile, mobile phones. You had to wait for people to catch up to their technology mm-hmm. sometimes. Yeah. Now the technology is trying to keep pace with the people, but consumers. But, you know, it's it's a very interesting journey. And, uh, and sometimes the main experience I say to people when you IPO is, how do you feel when you raise the dough? You, well, you're pretty happy. You're sort of relieved. The rest of it's management mm-hmm. after that, mm-hmm. you know, and you can't control whether technology is not the darling anymore or becomes a darling or someone else lists and someone else becomes the darling. Mm. You can't control any of that. That's right. Um, you just have to, you, the CEO, you have to manage your way through it. Um, but I'm glad I'm glad you were able to raise the money. Um, I'm glad you are able to do an IPO. And by the way, you're probably right. Trying to raise that sort of money at the time would have been very difficult with – VCs, etc., um, because Australian tech needs to be funded by Australians. Correct. And, we'll, and if ASX IPO is one way of doing it, then we should try it, try it out and try and get it done and get it sorted so we can get science up to where it needs to be. Yes. So I, I, I think I mean I, I'm going to follow Hit IQ. Um, you know, as you probably know, I'm involved in the Sydney Roosters, and uh, we are getting approached by lots of people in relation to the uh, uh, mouth guards at the moment. One of the things I will say to some of our players who should be wearing them um, uh, during training don't like to wear them. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, they don't wear a mouth guard. I can't even believe it. Like <laughs> you're training without a mouth guard, like what's wrong with you? Um, but it's more a habit. So you got to change a lot of habits. Yeah. You got to change a lot of behaviours. Yeah. And that that's a big deal. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but. but over time, I think it'll become, especially as younger people come through, the, the new ranks, if they start off with this, it's just going to be, oh, that's what we, that's what we wear. And, or, or if they're playing junior footy and they've already got one, yeah, like junior yeah, clubs, put right. them up. Correct. Are they expensive? Is price point a, an issue at the moment? Um, no. I mean, we, we sell these things for, for six, seven hundred bucks. Yeah, right? The mouth guard. Yeah, the, the mouth guard. The whole thing. The, 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 the hardware software package, yeah. right? Um, but what we sell is data. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's what that's our real yeah, product. Yeah, um, we just use the mouth guard. That's the vessel. Yeah, but um, that price point will come down as we scale. Yeah, as, yeah. We, as we get economies of scale and we, you know, we're able to fulfil larger order quantities and the price point will come down naturally. Um, so, like anything, right? When it first comes into market, it's more expensive yeah. and the price point dwindles down. Mobile phones, exactly right. So, <clears throat> I have one of the four thousand dollar ones back in nineteen eighty five. So <laughs> I know that. Yeah. And I, I, I was one of the uh, um, guinea pigs early days. Well, Mike, uh, look, I, I mean, concussion is a big topic for me in my life. Um, I love talking to people about this. Um, Hit IQ, uh, um, I will be following. Um, thanks for sharing your your experiences. More importantly, thanks for sharing your um, trials and tribulations because it's not an easy thing to do. But the ASX helped you out mm. and it's been a good outcome. So Mike Viga, co-founder and managing director of Hit IQ. Thanks very much, mate. Appreciate it.